G'day. Thanks for coming back from lunch. Uh, I'm Ben McAllister. I'm here to talk about the organ experiment, uh, which is the work of a great many people, not just myself, including a couple of people whose names aren't on this slide, and that's my mistake. Uh, but before we get to that, just wanted to say thanks so much to the organizing committee for all of their work organizing the whole conference and also for having me here today. I don't know about you all. I'm extremely thrilled to be back in person at these events, and uh, I know all of the Australians are, are thrilled to be out of the country. So. Uh, the organ experiment. It's an Axion Haloscope. We've been kicking around in the community for a little while. Um, it's a collaboration of different groups from around the country uh, in Australia. There are two what we call Australian Research Council Centres of Excellence, which are big nationwide research collaborations. Uh, one is focused on quantum systems, that's this one, and one is focused on dark matter particle physics, and this experiment kind of straddles both of them. Specifically, researchers from these universities are the ones who contribute to the organ collaboration today. All right, what are we going to talk about today? We are going to go through some general overview stuff, talk about the considerations to go into designing the organ experiment. Uh, we're going to talk about the organ run plan, the various different phases that we're, we're looking at or have completed. Uh, some R&D for future stuff, and then if we've got time, we'll talk about a couple of auxiliary offshoot experiments from Organ that are, that are new and in development at the moment. And then if we've got even more time, we'll talk about some other dark matter experiments that are happening within this kind of collaborative group. Okay, so uh, Organ is a high-mass axion haloscope collaboration. Uh, I'll say specifically what we mean by high mass in a little bit, because uh, the definitions on these things are somewhat fuzzy. Uh, the general idea is a haloscope, this well-known axion-photon coupling, conversion of axions into photons inside a resonant cavity with a schematic that looks roughly like that. I'm not going to bother going through any of this, because I think I'm the fourth or fifth haloscope talk this workshop so far. So what's different with organ? Uh, as I have mentioned, we are, oh, the, the other thing, uh, many people sometimes wonder where does the name organ come from? Uh, well, it's important in particle physics to have a really fun, weird backronym. So uh, we decided to build an experiment composed of many cavities, ultimately, that looks a bit like a pipe organ. And then we came up with a way to make the organ experiment out of uh, various words that have to do with axions and groups of resonators. Okay, so the mass range of interest for organ is 60 to 200 microelectron volts. If, like me, you like to think in terms of photons, that's something like 15 to 50-ish gigahertz. Um, the motivations for doing this, there are a few of them. The first one is the SMASH model, which has already been mentioned a couple of times, predicting axions in this kind of higher frequency or higher mass range than things like ADMX. Uh, there are also the much maligned now, but um, still weird and unexplained results in Joseph's injunctions that claimed some possible correlation to do with axions. Uh, and then there's, of course, just the fact that there's a lot of parameter space, and that parameter space up there is largely unexplored and, uh, by, by other, other searches. So we figured may as well jump in and try. Uh, so organ is broken down into different phases. We're currently in what we're calling phase one, which consists of a couple of targeted scans looking at relatively small chunks like gigahertz sized chunks uh, in, in specific mass ranges to test various technologies and, and develop our capacity. And then moving into phase two, which is a more sensitive, broader run in five gigahertz chunks. We'll talk about these things in a moment. And as I mentioned, some auxiliary experiments that we will get to if we have time. Okay, so how are we going to do all this stuff? We are pursuing a research program that contains a couple of different things. One is novel tunable resonators. Uh, for reasons that we will discuss, it's very hard to do haloscopes in this frequency range if we keep using these TM010 style resonators that uh, people are familiar with. Uh, we're also interested in superconductors, high field superconductors, of course, to, to boost the quality factors of our resonators. Uh, low noise amplification and photon counting readout is, is very important for, for future high mass haloscope work. And data acquisition and analysis, we're always considering new ideas to, to improve things there as well. Okay, so what goes into building an organ? Uh, or any haloscope, really. We've seen this scan rate equation, or something similar to it, which is the figure of merit for axion haloscopes. Those who are not familiar with this expression, with these cavity haloscopes, the, the dominant figure of merit is the allowable rate of frequency scanning at a given sensitivity. So essentially how fast can move your thing around, uh, given all of your experimental parameters. And this thing uh, is made up of a couple of different things. There's stuff that has to do with the cavity. That's the axion form factor. That's the volume of the resonator. That's the loaded quality factor of the cavity. Then the stuff that has to do with the, the fridge and the magnet. Uh, we're talking, obviously, about the magnetic field strength, B to the 4 here. And I put weakly the noise temperature, of course. If you can get the thing colder, that helps the noise temperature to some extent. 
And then there's stuff that has to do with the readout, which is the, the dominant contribution to the noise temperature, how you actually read out your signal. And essentially, we're interested in improving all of these things, as I, I think everyone in the, in the Haloscope space is. So that's a, a bit of an overview of the considerations. There's a bunch of stuff we can't really control, like the mass of the axion and the effective quality factor and the density and the axion-photon coupling. Uh, and one of the design challenges associated with haloscopes is that the best version of all of the things that we can control seems to be pretty heavily dependent on where in frequency space you're doing a search. So you can also see from this expression some of the challenges associated with going to high frequencies, um, specifically the volume. Uh, as resonators go to higher frequencies, they have to get smaller, and that means that the volume goes down. You also lose by axion mass. You also lose by the surface resistance of materials, which makes the quality factors go down. So there's a number of things conspiring against you. Um, but there are tricks we can play to, to try and claw some of that nature-imposed disadvantage back, and that's a lot of the R&D that we work on. Okay, fortunately, one of these things is taken care of, for us at least. We have this Blue Force Dilution Refrigerator. Uh, the base temperature on it, it's an XLD system. The base temperature on it when it was installed went below the range of the calibrated sensors. So all we can say with confidence is it's somewhere below 7 millikelvin, probably not lower than 5 and a bit, but <laughs> it's somewhere in that range. Um, it has a 12.5 Tesla magnet attached to it. And conveniently, it's dedicated for doing organ searches, so we don't have to compete for time with other experiments. We can just throw anything in there and, and run it when it's ready. Okay, so that's the green stuff taken care of for now. What about all this other stuff? Well, we'll get to it in time. I just want to throw up the run plan, and then we can go through each of these different experiments in uh, a bit more detail in a moment. So uh, as I have mentioned, we're beginning in phase one. That's these green bands here, one A and one B, which are roughly gigahertz-sized chunks before moving into phase two. We're in frequency units here again, remember? I, I did say that that was how I like to think about these things. Um, the things that we're highlighting here, yep, so phase one. Uh, the general working ethos behind phase one is to do stuff with things that already exist, things that we have on hand, and just explore this parameter space. So, so take those standard TM010 tuning rod resonator designs that are, that are well developed, take hemp amplifiers rather than trying to invent some new technology to, to get started with, and just doing the best that we can in those ranges. And then in phase two, in parallel with running these first searches, we're developing, we're doing R&D in various kinds of scale-ups and improvements that we can use to, to push down deeper into the axion parameter space there. So you'll notice that there are sort of two sets of limits in each of these phases. The idea there is that, as you can see, for phase one, our less optimistic projections are just hemped amplifiers. And for phase two, that's using quantum amplifiers, JPAs, things like that. Um, the more optimistic limits come from if we can develop efficient gigahertz single photon counting. I'll talk a little bit about what we're trying to do in that space a bit later. Uh, but that's really the, the, golden, the golden key, if you will, to doing really sensitive axion haloscopes in this kind of mass range. Okay, so uh, let's talk about 1A. So 1A is an axion scan around 15 gigahertz in frequency space. Uh, it started last year. It has now completed. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we just use a, a standard type of resonator, a 010 mode with a, with a conducting rod around inside it uh, and a hemp amplifier. Here's a picture of the cavity. It's pretty small, as you, as you can see, for getting up to 15 gigahertz. Uh, this is one of our calibration runs here. The piezo motor is, is directly coupled to the rod because again, it's small, so we can, we can do these things. Um, one of the things, oh, and, and yes, one of the uh, big inputs that made this doable was the acquisition of a zero dead time FFT on an FPGA digitizer that we acquired from one of our collaborators, or one of our collaborators helped to develop this from the Australian National University. That's Paul Alton, whose name I omitted from the front of the presentation. Okay, so one of the things we learned along the way is that doing stuff in high frequencies is really difficult. Um, part of the problem is just that the relative tolerances are a, a, a problem because if we have gaps on the end of our rod that are like the same size as the rod gaps on an ADMX experiment, relative to the size of the cavity, that's huge, which plays all kinds of drama with your uh, mode crossings and, and things like that. So you want to make those rod gaps really, really, really small if you can. And then the challenge associated with that is to get the thing to move. So this was uh, a picture that we saw a lot during the commissioning stage of this experiment, where you can see that the frequency of the resonator would tune for a little while once it was cold, and then it would stop because the rod got stuck somewhere. So that was fairly common. Uh, lots of iteration uh, was, was done to determine the best way to overcome this issue. You can see that the rod was actually carving tracks in the top of the cavity there, so scratching up the cavity lid, which meant we need to get new lids made. 
all kinds of things like that. Um, this is just the reality, and, and one of the reasons that we think we need to use new resonators going forward to get better sensitivity in these regions, because if we want to go up to 50 gigahertz with these things, they're going to be so small, it's, it's quite impractical. <laughs> so, we did eventually get it working. There you, there you go, you can see it tunes all nicely. Uh, iterations of design, just getting better at aligning the rod. Uh, we ultimately had to take a bit of a hit in terms of the rod gaps in order to get the thing to tune nicely. But as you can see, the mode interactions are not, not too terrible in this kind of range that, that we did most of the run. So, um, great. That experiment ended up running for about a month in the cavity to a bunch of positions. We ran it at 4 Kelvin, or with the amp running, 5.2. Um, again, the idea here was that the amps are hemped anyway, so we're not going to necessarily gain by cooling the thing down. Or, and we wanted to just do what we could do simply with, with gear on hand. Uh, we followed this, this uh, haystack data analysis procedure that was discussed a bit yesterday uh, with the various corrections that, that need to be done to, to account for the, the Savitsky Gaulle filtering. And ultimately, uh, as was presented earlier this morning, we arrive with these exclusion limits for organ phase 1A, which exclude this alpcogenesis model of dark matter over this frequency range or this corresponding mass range. Now, the idea here is that these gaps we're not too worried about because we know we're coming back here in phase 2 anyway. So we can come back with better sensitivity and, and fill in these regions where there were mode interactions. So that's, that's the plan. But that's the, the first scanned result here, uh, excluding this alpcogenesis range. So we're, we're, pretty, we're pretty pleased with this result up here above 15 gigahertz. It was a bit of an effort to accomplish. Um, and yes, this, this result's now published in Science Advances, so you can check out all the gory details if you like. Okay, so phase 1b is uh, a similar kind of search. We're currently preparing it. Uh, this time we're going up around 26 to 27 gigahertz rather than down at 15 to 16. The fallback idea is again to use one of these resonators which now we've had commercially produced rather than produced in house and silver plated this is the the rod here on the thing it's very very small uh, it's it's been silver plated the finish looks quite nice uh, the idea here is is to operate this experiment at millik and, and and test out a bunch of different coupling strategies to, to run the long distance up to 4k from the from the cavity to the amplifier so uh, but as I mentioned this is this is the we will run with this kind of resonator if we don't develop an alternative in the meantime, which is one of our parallel lines of R&D. So we are developing some new resonator ideas, which may take the place of these tuning rods if we can get them running nicely. Okay. Uh, oh, as I mentioned, we're also looking at new readouts rather than hemp amplifiers. Same story. If we can get them working in time, we'll use them. And we're also looking at superconducting coatings. So... Um, Right, that's phase 1A that we've just covered, and phase 1B, which is in development. They're up here and up here, unless we can do something exciting and maybe get down here. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about phase 2, uh, which I've just discussed the various R&D aspects associated with getting into phase 2, these, these things here. So how, how exactly are we going to do that? Let's consider our design considerations. So we've already discussed, we're using the same fridge and magnet. We're not swapping that out just yet, but we are going to try and do some stuff with cavities, and we're going to try and do some stuff with a readout as well to enhance the sensitivity. So what does our current, one of our current lines of research and development in novel haloscope resonators is what we're calling dielectric boosted axion sensitivity resonators. So the idea here is that you take some higher order mode something that's not a 0, 1, 0 mode, which would not ordinarily be sensitive to axions because the field distribution, and then you place a bunch of dielectric wedges in there and change the field patterns and make the mode sensitive. So you take, for example, a TM410 mode in an empty cavity where the EZ field looks like this or like this as a function of phi. You place some dielectric wedges in these out of phase regions, you suppress the field there, and you end up getting decent form factors for modes that look like this or like this, where there's net overlap. Uh, this one has no sensitivity at this position, but as you, well, we'll get there in a moment. So this is the, the most sensitive mode here. Um, so this is a, a thing that we are, we are currently trying to develop. The, the nice thing about this idea is just by introducing the dielectric wedges, you not only gain that sensitivity, you also have a built-in tuning mechanism. You don't need to introduce a rod on top of this, you just use the wedges that are already in there and move them around. So you can take a position where the wedges are perfectly symmetrical and you tune them closer and closer together until they're all the way together. And there are these three modes in any given configuration of wedges that end up being sensitive to axions that cover these different frequency ranges here. So these are for some just dummy parameters down at like 10 to 15 gigahertz. 
and these are the different modes. So we can see that this TM410-like uh, mode, as we call it, which becomes much more TM410-like as you tune the wedges together, is actually the most sensitive. Uh, it, it loses sensitivity quickly when you, when you get to this position, but it, it has some sensitivity, uh, or quite good sensitivity compared to the other designs when you, when you are in the non-perfectly symmetrical wedge regime. So if you'd like to see the modeling on that, then there is a paper here you can check out. And as I mentioned, we've got a prototype of this thing. We got together with Meller Optics, and they produced these wedges for us. Um, they're quite thin and long, and uh, it was quite impressive that they were able to produce them. So we have four of these sapphire wedges. They're in a cavity. Um, it's undergoing investigation at the moment. It's, it's tuned for that 26 to 27 gigahertz range. So uh, if we can get that running nicely, we'll, we'll swap it in for the tuning rod resonator. Otherwise, uh, we will continue to analyze it uh, amongst some other ideas for, for use in phase two. Okay, I mentioned superconductors. So one of the recent developments for us here uh, is that we have a new collaborator within the organ collaboration, which is Swinburne University of Technology on the other side of Australia in, in Melbourne. Uh, and one of the exciting things there, exciting prospects, is Swinburne is in possession of a nanofabrication facility. So we can do some interesting stuff in terms of both developing quantum uh, superconducting devices and also superconducting coatings for resonators. So uh, we are pursuing a research program in what we can do to cues of microwave cavities that are coated in niobium alloys that end up having high critical fields. So this is another one of our areas of R&D. Uh, a nice thing that we have done in the past that we intend to do to characterize these things is to characterize the field that's actually inside the cavity compared to the field outside the cavity in situ. Uh, we, we did a proof of concept experiment for this with a solid niobium cavity pictured here with a little lithium ferrite sphere inside. And then by monitoring the frequency of the magnon modes inside that sphere, we can determine how much magnetic field is inside the cavity versus outside. Uh, this is the result there. I mean, as you can see, it converges, as you would expect, as the field ramps up. But at least in bulk, it's not necessarily the same at low fields. So that is uh, a good thing to do to characterize these thin film resonators that we're, we're developing. OK, uh, and if you'd like to see more about this work, that is there. OK, so that's the superconducting R&D. Right, now we've talked about some of the cavity stuff we're working on. We've talked about the fridge and magnet. So it's time to talk about amplifiers and readouts that we're going to use to enhance phase two. So it is not a secret that single photon detection is the future of these high frequency axion experiments. Uh, we can see why if we just take some dummy parameters for organ, some relatively conservative uh, temperature numbers, a frequency, a noise temperature of the standard quantum limit, and we compare the ratio of the effective noise power in a linear amplifier at the quantum limit to a single photon counter that's shot noise limited. Uh, and if you plug in these above parameters and figure out like the cavity occupation numbers at a given temperature, if you have this efficiency, you can see that the standard quantum limited amplifier is about 50 times noisier. And as I said, these are quite conservative. If you lower that temperature, it can very quickly become many, many thousands of times better to use a single photon counter over using a linear amplifier in this frequency range. So it's clearly the way forward and the way that we're going to be able to push down into the QCD model bands with these types of resonators. So we would like single photon counters in the tens of gigahertz range. Um, if you've got one, let me know. As far as I'm aware, this is something that a lot of people are very interested in for a number of different reasons. There are a few options that are being considered. One thing that we are looking at is current bias Josephson junctions. The general idea here is that you have a Josephson junction that's sitting at some bias current below the critical current. You interact it with a photon and kick the junction into the voltage state. So it acts as a sort of destructive click detector as opposed to like a non-demolition type measurement. And I borrowed this figure from Leonid Kuzmin, who is one of the pioneers of these devices and has since tragically passed away. Um, so these are still very much in R&D. And we do have some samples. Uh, the design of them is, is, is quite difficult. We have some samples that we've acquired from Chalmers Institute of Technology uh, that have been integrated into PCBs. And we are undergoing testing to determine things like dark count rates and efficiencies compared with these theoretical curves based on uh, modeling of macroscopic quantum tunneling and other effects. So that is very much in progress. Um, and that brings us to the full discussion of this run plan diagram that I threw up, the various phases what we're doing for what we've done for 1A, what we're doing for 1B, and what we are hoping to do for phase 2A through 2G. So uh, with that out of the way, I would like to talk about some of the new auxiliary organ experiments that we have been developing in the last little while. So the first thing I want to talk about is what we're calling organ Q, which is a new experiment that we're developing in the 6 to 10-ish gigahertz range. The exact frequency is still being nailed down. 
But the general idea is to use this experiment as a test bed for a bunch of different things that we want to integrate in phase two. We've got spare dilution fridge space kicking around, so we figure we may as well throw a cavity in there and uh, try out some of these technologies ahead of time if we can. So things we want to look at, quantum limited amplifiers, assuming the photon counters or as a fallback for photon counters, superconducting coatings, as I've mentioned, and a bunch of other different improvements to the mechanical designs of these resonators. So we're going to use this uh, older uh, LD dilution fridge from Blue Force that is equipped with a larger bore seven Tesla magnet. The idea is to commence this run later this year or early next year and test some combination of these different things. Um, so we've got a cavity prototype. That is where we're investigating the use of these clamshell type resonators now. Uh, and we will likely iterate this design. It's a, it's a prototype at this point in time. Um, so we are sourcing, we're looking at JPA sourcing at the moment. There are commercial options available, but we also have the capacity through some collaborators to produce them locally. Uh, various other things we want to test include different ways of coupling between the cavity and the quantum amplifier, how good our magnetic shielding can be between the cavity and the, and the, the quantum electronics that need to go up on the, the cold plate. So there are various things to test with, with organ Q here. The plan is to do something like five to 10 times KSVZ sensitivity in a couple of months, somewhere between six and 10 gigahertz. Another experiment to mention is the forthcoming organ low frequency offshoot. So there seems to have been a lot of increased interest in pushing down into low frequency space for axions in the last uh, couple of years, uh, particularly below 500 megahertz here. And there are various cosmological motivations. I won't pretend to be a theorist and, and go through them in, in nitty gritty details. Um, but the nice thing about going down in frequency as opposed to going up in frequency, if we pull up our scan rate expression here, is that you win in a few ways. So the axion mass goes down, that's nice. Uh, the quantum noise limit of the amplifiers goes down, that's also nice. Uh, the surface resistance of the materials goes down, that helps you a bit there. The thing that is both good and bad is that the cavities get really, really big if you want to look in these ranges and you can't fit them inside superconducting solenoids. So what can you do about that? One potential solution to this is to use something called a reentry cavity or a lumped LC resonator. Uh, the idea here is to take a big cavity and introduce a reentrant post and push the frequency of the cavity resonator down to, to low, low numbers. And you do take a bit of a hit to the form factor. So we post, published this article a while ago about just an, an idea to, to do something like this. The idea of these resonators is you have a post and you enter this reentrant regime where there's a lot of electric field concentrated here. So you essentially have an effective reduced volume, if you like, but you can fit the thing inside the bore of the magnet. And on top of that, uh, as you pull the post out, of course, it transitions smoothly from this reentrant mode to the TM010 mode of the empty cavity. So depending on where specifically in frequency space you want to look, you can regain a lot of that form factor that you lose. Okay, um, we're not actually planning to use a simple rod resonator like this. We're planning to use a, a new slightly more complicated design, uh, which will be the subject of forthcoming publication. So uh, where do you put this thing? It's certainly not going to fit inside the 12 and a half Tesla magnet at Organ, Maine in University of Western Australia. Well, the nice thing is our uh, partner collaborator at Swinburne University has a three Tesla MRI machine that they're happy to let us stick a cavity in. So that's exciting. It's kind of person sized. We're replacing this person and this person with a cavity and some electronics. So uh, hopefully we will have this experiment up and running in the next sort of year scale. This is what we think we can do with it uh, in our initial room temperature experiment, just a big cavity inside the magnet using a hemp amplifier. And then if we were to imagine scaling it up to use a squid amplifier in a 4K system. So uh, not pushing down into the model bands, but we can tell with like QCD model bands, we can test out cogenesis uh, directly. And we are also just firmly of the opinion our design ethos in organ is if you can do the experiment, you should and just start doing it. So that's, that's the idea for the organ low frequency offshoot. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, now it's time for the shameless plug fest of all of the other experiments that are going on at UWA within the collaboration. So uh, the first thing I'd like to mention is the work that William Campbell presented yesterday on the scalar dark matter experiment that we did at UWA. So uh, if you missed Will's poster presentation or his poster, I highly encourage you to go check it out. The idea is we take these models of scalar dark matter, which propose couplings to various fundamental constants, fine structure constant, various mass ratios, and the QCD scale. And then we do clock comparison experiments, because one of the things that the UWA lab that now hosts Organ has been an expert in for a very long time is frequency metrology. So we have existing, well-developed frequency metrology standards, 
like uh, cryogenic sapphire oscillators, which depend on photons, hydrogen mazes, which depend on atoms, and quartz oscillators, which depend on acoustic vibrations. And by comparing these things, we can determine uh, various different combinations of fundamental constants and, and place limits on variations. So uh, I encourage you to go see William Campbell's poster about that. Uh, the next thing I'll mention is, in the vein of other things that you can check out posters on, the upload experiment, this uh, other frequency metrology phase noise experiment that is also now a power detection experiment uh, that Katrina presented on yesterday. So uh, that is another experiment within the same laboratory that uses a lot of the same technology. Um, so if you're interested in hearing about that, I suggest you go see Katrina Thompson's poster. Then I will also just mention, uh, as we heard from Igor yesterday, there is a new proposal to search for scalar field dark matter using cavity resonators. Uh, and searching for this effect with organ is something that we have in the pipeline as well. So we're looking at ways we can implement that in terms of the organ run cadence. And uh, I will mention this paper here, which was talking about detecting high frequency gravitational waves in microwave cavities, which Mike will talk about on Thursday, if you'd like to hear about our plans for that. The last thing I'll mention is this axion magnon experiment, this axion electron coupling experiment that was performed also at UWA within the same lab a couple of years ago. Uh, it's very similar to a QAX type experiment, and you can check out the details of that here. No poster for that one, unfortunately. So I will leave you with the conclusions that with Organ, we have commenced running in our phase one and phase two region. We've got our data, we're, we're ready to keep going, and we have a couple of new experiments and a couple of new collaborators as well. So thank you. Well, thank you for the fantastic talk, and uh, let's open it up for some questions. And also, if you're in the poster lightning session, you can begin to think about making your way up for the next round. Uh, Giannis. Thank you. That was very exciting. Um, I don't know the slide, but the, they look like the pizza cavities. Can you go there? Yes. The question is, uh, how do you read them out? Right. Um, just with a, a standard field probe like you would use in a TM010 cavity that sticks into the top of one of these segments. So um, you don't actually, so th there's two options. If we consider this, this top thing, for example, um, we're tuning, say, this wedge and this wedge towards this wedge and this wedge, which means that this region never touches. Uh, uh, but how do you know where you are when you move the wedges? Uh, the frequency of the modes, comparing modeling against, against observed frequencies. And, and you know the tolerances and such things. Tolerances. Well, yeah, we, we know how we expect the modes to tune, so it would obviously just be a matter of comparing the experiment to the simulations. Thank you. Well, I have a loud voice, so I need, uh, don't need, oh, okay, I have one. I hope it helps. Uh, you mentioned um, novel reentrant cavities. In fact, they are not really that novel. They were used in large variations and quantities in the accelerator field about 30 to 50 years ago. And the reason why I mention it here, the basic concept is very simple. But there were all kinds of tricks to get the high order modes away and to tune them. And in case you, well probably you know it, but the others want to find literature, I would like to recall the Jacob page. What does Jacob stand for? Joint Accelerator Conference Web. Jacob in one word, mm -hmm. and there you can download all the conference papers on accelerator structures and so on from the last 50 years for free. Great, thank you very much. Yes, what I meant by novel designs was not the, the post design, it's some, a, new, a new type of thing, but yes, as you say, everything old is new again at some point in time, so of course. I'm sure somebody did it in the Soviet Union in like 40 years ago or something. Yeah, I, just, I want to ask you, these uh, few hundred megahertz preference by cosmologists, how it ca they come about, and how solid are they? Sure. Uh, well, as I said, uh, I, I'm not a theorist, so I'm not going to pretend to um, really delve into the nitty-gritty. It, it's the standard pre-inflationary mechanism, and I know that some cosmology models recently have preferred this lower mass range for, for forming potentially much higher density things that, that contain okay, lower mass thanks. axions. Okay, maybe one last question. Uh, thanks for the excellent talk. My question is about a, uh, the current bias Josephson junction type, a single photon count. Is it a counter or a calorimeter? 
my question is that the, does it have any energy resolution or like a NIP or something like that? Yeah, so you wouldn't necessarily get energy resolution out of it. Um, it would be just like an on-off state counter, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, you know, the Stux collaboration is making a very similar device. They call it like a Josephson escape uh, sensor, mm -hmm. current biased, then that is tunable. That they uh, say that they can reach 10 to minus 25 in NIP. Then uh, I was looking for some uh, this similar uh, numbers, but they say uh, the different thing. Right. Well, I mean, these these do -do -do projections that I've put on for these photon counters are, I mean. Yeah, you could go further. This is just, we would stop here because that's the region we're trying to scan. If you had a really nice photon counter of this type with truly low dark count rates and truly high efficiency, you can actually go a lot further, for sure. Thank you. Okay, let's thank Ben again for a fantastic talk.